greetings to you from the regional team at Southern Counties Baptist Association. I wonder if you've noticed the new pathways that have been appearing around and about as you've been out walking. There are several new pathways just near here on the cliff top. There's a large expanse of green, there's a, an old established route that goes fairly near the cliff edge which is the preferred way that people want to go. But because of keeping socially distanced, people have been making choices as, they, as they've seen other people coming towards them and they've taken other routes across the green. And so now you can see where those pathways are. What will be interesting is as lockdown eases, whether people stop making quite so much effort and return to just agilely stepping aside as they use the main path, which is the old established one. It's sort of a picture, isn't it, of the choices that we are facing in our churches and as leadership teams. While the government said uh, these things are required to protect the vulnerable, then there were no choices to be made apart from making it work and it being very, very difficult and demanding and being creative. So many churches have been wonderfully creative. Now that there are more choices, it's actually harder. And it's a choice between retaining the new paths and keep on using those, or returning to the old paths and doing things entirely the same as before, business as usual, or a mixture of those and learning that some routes that were well established before might even be retired because they're no longer fit for purpose or sustainable. The challenge is this, how do you choose what to retire, what to retain that's been new, and what to return to that was already there before? How do you choose? And as I was pondering this, uh, I was led to Matthew 21 and a story of two ways two pathways into Jerusalem, although I need to be honest with you, only one is mentioned. The one we're very familiar with is the one that Jesus chose as he rode in from the east, from the Mount of Olives, on a donkey into Jerusalem, a peasant procession, one that was celebrated by his followers and friends, one which generated a lot of excitement and indeed criticism from the religious authorities. But there was another pathway from the west, which Pontius Pilate would have used as he came in to Jerusalem during the Passover festival to make it quite clear that the Romans were around. If in this big gathering there was any sense of a potential riots, then they were there to quell it. And he would have ridden in on uh, uh, a large horse, almost certainly, there would have been horses with bridles and armour and weapons all glinting in the sun, uh, the shining off the helmets and all of those things, and it would have made a very impressive sight. One is the riding in that represents power and authority and might and force, and the other representing, as Jesus goes in, a place of great humility and wanting to serve and give and be prepared to suffer and to seek out those that are on the margins. And here then are some of the clues as we ask the question, how do you choose what to retain, what to return to and what to retire? Here's the sort of values that I discover in this passage. The first one is this, that as Jesus comes in, he honours the little children who celebrates and get excited about him coming in. In fact, he stands up for them when they're criticised and says, from the lips of children and infants, you, Lord, have called forth your praise, says the psalm. So he stands up for the little ones. So here's one question, is, which is, in terms of what we retain or return to, how are those of little influence, little power, whether they be children or of any age, how are they included in what we're doing, in the decisions that we make, those that are vulnerable, but those that God particularly has an eye to? Here's the second thing that we see as well as Jesus comes in, and it's this. He comes into the temple courts. He's well known for overturning 
the tables of the money changers and those selling doves. And he says he's doing it because my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, not a den of brigands. And in that he's referring to Isaiah 56, which is about including those who are marginalised and that are seemingly written out of God's story and God's people. So there's something about that question, which is, as we've returned to praying in a way that perhaps we've not done for some while, and many more people engaging in praying, and deepening their connection with God, and deepening their sense of what it means to follow Christ, how will that be enabled through the things that we decide to retain or to return to? And are there some things which actually don't really serve that purpose? How can deepening of connection with God for all people continue to happen? For some, of course, that's happened particularly through small groups and meeting in those sorts of ways where there's a greater intimacy and where working out what it means to follow God has been uh, fleshed out by conversation and standing with one another and friendship and, of course, looking at the scriptures and what we discover about God. And, of course, what we discover about God is the key question. Because sometimes we get a sense that actually God is the God who is uh, full of force and might and power and going to uh, make people do things and all of those things. Sometimes the way we sing or speak of God makes it seem a bit like that. What we actually discover here is that God is the God of huge humility, who comes in uh, unrecognised by those that have got authority and influence and comes in wanting to serve and give of himself and to love and even go to uh, a Roman cross. So there's something about what sort of God is enabled and embodied in the way that we retain certain pathways or the things that we return to. What sort of God? And of course there's something else here as well which is the sort of God who Jesus brings and represents is the sort of God who, as he comes into Jerusalem, the city of Shalom, he makes clear is willing to heal the blind and the lame. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple and he healed them. So here's a, a, another question for us to ask, which is, when we decide what to retain and what to return to, how much is there a measure of helping people to flourish and be whole in every respect, particularly with the huge pressures that are around in terms of mental health at this time? And uh, as that continues to be a challenge as lockdown eases, but as we face continuing uncertainty with no vaccine found yet, and so aware that at any point further waves could happen and responses need be needed. Is there healing and wholeness enabled, not just for those that are already part of the Christian communities that we're in, but also beyond that? Is that a possibility? So these are challenging days, aren't they? We've got uh, the freedom now to choose which pathways to continue on, which ones to return to and which ones to retire. And as we do that, an encouragement that Jesus specifically prays that the Spirit will be given to us to guide us into all truth, to help us to discover what it means to live for him in practice. And of course, that echoes that great sentence in Isaiah 30, which I've been reminded of again just recently. That sentence that talks about your ears hearing a voice behind you and the voice saying, this is the way, walk in it. In the end, we ask good questions about what we should retain or return to or retire. But in the end, there is that instinct which is spirit given, which helps us to know freely and to choose freely. These are the things we're going to keep on doing. These are the things we're going to go back to doing. And these are the things we're going to drop. So God bless you in these uh, demanding times and uh, let's pray together as we conclude this time of reflection.
dear God, we do sometimes get very anxious about how we're going to resolve the dilemmas that we have now that increasingly we can make choices about what to retire, what to retain and what to return to in our church life and mission. And so we pray that you'd help us to go beyond anxiety, to bring that to you, to trust you, to be the God who really will help us to have a sense of that which we should develop further and what we should drop. And we pray, Lord, that as we do so, you'd help us to include all the people in our congregations and in our church communities. And particularly, Lord, that we find ways to connect with those who are beyond the church, who have been open in recent months to think about spiritual things and to look at churches to see if there's anything of hope and goodness there. Help us particularly, Lord, to see how that can be a priority in the decisions we make. In Jesus' name. Amen.